Hi class, in this recording we're going to be focusing on our hair and our nails. And I, I'll slip up and say fingernails, but when, I, when we talk about nails, it's both finger and toenails that we're really referring to. And as we look at our hair and nails, these are some of the accessory organs or structures of our skin. We also have a bunch of glands that are categorized as accessory structures. Uh, we'll talk about those um, in a subsequent recording. So as we look at our hair and nails, they're mostly going to be made up of keratin and fully keratinized cells or dead cells filled with keratin. And there's two kinds or variations of this keratin and how it's organized. It's not just the, the individual proteins molecular shape, but it's how we connect individual keratin molecule, molecules to each other that's going to influence whether it's pliable and soft or compact and hard. We typically have a lot of pliable and soft keratin in the most superficial layer of our epidermis, the stratum corneum. We'll also find that we have compact and hard keratin that makes up the hair and nails of our body. And the reason this other kind of keratin, this keratin is compact and hard is because it's more connected, more interconnected. There's more cross linkages between individual keratin molecules. So let's talk about hair. An individual hair can be referred to as a pillus. So that's a technical name for a hair. Pili is the plural of pillus. Most people just say hair and hairs though. Um, but if you, particularly if you have a molecular biology background um, or a microbiology background, you've heard of a sex pillus, which is a hair-like structure that goes from one bacterium to another bacterium and it's used to exchange segments of DNA or genetic information is how um, antibiotic resistance can rapidly transmit from one species of bacteria to another. We as individual humans don't have sex hairs or sex pili. We have just regular hairs filled with keratin. As I'm going to primarily use hair as my term because it's easier for me to understand. So we have a lot of keratinized cells or keratin filled cells in our hair, and it's going to grow in a tube. The tube itself is the hair follicle. And this hair follicle is deep in the skin. So it's going to extend down into the, through the epidermis, into the dermis of our skin. So the tube is the follicle. And as we look at hair, most of our body is going to have hair. Anywhere we have thin skin, as a rule of thumb, we are going to have hair on our body. And it doesn't necessarily need to be easily visible hair, really long, dark colored hair. We have lots of little light white, fine white hairs all over our bodies. Here's another good rule of thumb. If you've ever got pimples in that part of your body, that part of your body has hair follicles because pimples will be associated with hair follicles and the sebaceous glands next to the hair follicle. Parts of our body though that don't have hairs or hair follicles are going to be parts of our body that have elevate that will have to need to have some functional reason for elevated friction. So the most notable are the bottom of your feet, the palm, or, or excuse me, the, the palm of your hands, or the bottom of your feet, the plantar region of your feet. So palmar and plantar surfaces aren't going to have a lot of hair. Also, fingers and toes, generally speaking, don't have a lot of hairs. Think of the sides of your fingers and toes. The side or lateral surfaces of your fingers and toes are constantly rubbing against each other. And you can't see on the camera, but I'm, I'm wiggling my fingers right now. Um, and because they constantly rub against each other, you don't want some hair in there. That hair is going to be serve as an irritation or an increased amount of friction or increased friction and irritation. Uh, let's talk sexual reproduction. Uh, uh, there's the, the head and shaft of the penis. That would have it uh, during vaginal intercourse has increased friction. So we're not going to have a bunch of hair there. Um, or if we think of the labia minora at, or the vestibule of the female's reproductive system or the vaginal canal, again, we have, to, we have increased friction in those areas um, during se sexual intercourse. We don't want a bunch of hair right there. Or if you think of nipples, um, and I'm not talking around the outside of your nipples, um, particularly in grown men or post-pubescent males, um, having hairy nipples around the outside of the nipple is fairly common. But we think of the areola itself, or um, the central regions of the areola, and the tip, the nipple itself, we don't have hair there 
because of breastfeeding and the ability, the necessary, how it's necessary for us as mammals, as a species, uh, to breastfeed newborn children. Um, when we think of our limbs, so arms and legs, and then the trunk of our body, we have, you know, uh, hair. So, you know, we have a moderate density of hair, and I don't necessarily care about this number. Don't memorize the numbers, but we just have hairs there. Um, and then on our face, we have a much higher concentration of hairs. So think back to when you were, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, um, most of the pimples you got during that awkward stage of your life were probably on your face. And a reason for that is because most, uh, we have a very high density of hairs on our face. Um, and then when you look at our scalp, a typical person um, or average person who is not bald or suffering from alopecia is going to have about 100,000 hairs-ish on their scalp. And this changes over your lifetime um, based on hormones, um, and also is going to have some genetic predispositions as well. Um, and from one individual to another individual, differences in the hair are primarily going to be associated um, with the texture of the hair and the pigmentation of the hair. So for instance, um, think of post-pubescent males or grown men that can grow a beard. The hair of their scalp tends to be finer and thinner. The hair of their face their beard hair tends to be thicker and coarser. And no, it's not because they shave. That's an urban legend. Shaving does not make your hair get coarser. The issue is that you start shaving when you hit puberty. And when you hit puberty, hair follicles are exposed to hormones that make hairs become coarser. So it's a correlation, not a causation. Shaving doesn't make your hair get thicker. You typically start shaving once your hairs will naturally become thicker anyways. So let's look at typical hair. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. So here's a generic hair follicle or hair. Uh, we have the follicle. I'm going to trace it in green. It's kind of the outer border. We have the hair shaft. I'm going to say, or the hair root. The hair root I typically define as the part beneath the surface. And then in blue, we have this, this enlargement at the deepest portion. That is the bulb of the hair. And then when we think of shaft, that is going to be anything that's superficial or above the surface of the epidermis. Let me back up the slide now for us here. So when we think of bulb, it's at the deepest part of the hair in the dermis. It's at the base and it's a swelling at the base. Uh, excuse me. Occasionally, it'll even be located down in the hypodermis, but that's not terribly common. And when we think of the bulb, this is where we have actively reproducing cells that are going to make our hair grow longer. So if you pluck a hair, um, or get maybe you get your legs waxed, or another part of your body waxed, or you pluck hairs, you're pulling out the bulb. And by pulling out the bulb, you remove most of the living hair cells. And by removing those living hair cells, you make it, most of the living hair cells, you make it so it takes a longer time for the hair to grow back. So as we look at the root, the root is the part of the hair within the hair follicle. And then the follicle itself wraps around the root. Um, so think of the root as the part of the hair fiber in that's deep in the skin. And then you have the shaft. The shaft is the part of the hair fiber that's above the surface of the skin. Now, as we look at the, our hairs, they'll be next to dermal papilla. And these dermal papilla are going to have lots of vascular tissue, lots of blood vessels, and they supply a lot of nutrients for the hair. Um, as we look at the matrix of our hair, this is going to be the part of the hair that's going to have actively reproducing cells direct um, associated with the papilla, and this is where we're going to have the growth occur. So I'm going to clear the slide here, jump forward a bit. So here's our hair. You know, here's a photomicrograph here. We have this enlargement of the hair. The enlargement of the hair fiber is the bulb. And the follicle, you can see in kind of this darker pink color, wraps around the hair root and the hair bulb. Let me clear the screen for us, and I'm going to shift to bright green. We also are going to have a dermal papilla 
extend upward into the bulb of the hair. And that dermal papilla supplies nutrients so that we can grow new hair. So the hair can increase in length. And then finally, we have the hair matrix. I'm going to go with yellow here. The hair matrix is going to be kind of the central portion of the hair fiber, where kind of in the middle of there, where we're going to be actively reproducing the hair. Um, and then we have the hair medulla and hair cortex. We're not going to focus on those. Um, if you get a degree in dermatology or forensic science, you can learn more about those later. Uh, but what we care about is that down here, uh, where we have the dermal papilla and the hair matrix deep down in the bulb, this is where our hairs grow. This is what causes our hairs to increase in length. <coughs> when somebody has electrolysis done on their hairs, they will have an electric current sent down the shaft of the hair, through the root of the hair, all the way down to the bulb and matrix of the hair, and they will electrocute those cells and electrically kill those cells associated with causing the hair to grow. And repeated treatments can kill all of the cells and make it so that you no longer hair, have hair growing in that part of your body. So, moving on. Oh, oh snap. Here we go, moving on. As we focus on our hair, um, the middle shaft of our hair is typically called the medulla. The outer lining of the outside of the hair is called the cortex. And this is the part that you typically are going to see as you look at hair. And you know this is where most of the color is going to be, or pigment is going to be in our hair, uh, on the hairs that you see growing on somebody. And then we also have a cuticle. And this cuticle, is going to be on the very, very ed outer edge of the hair. And they are going to have some scaly cells overlapping with each other. And the free edges of the cuticle are gonna be directed upward. And this helps to dictate hair growth and water flowing from the hair. So because you can think of these, these multiple layers as thin scaly cells as kind of like shingles on a roof. And the way that they're oriented, it helps to direct hair or water away from the surface of our skin to flow away from the epidermis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as we look at our hair follicle, just to reiterate again, it wraps around the hair root. It's going to extend down into the dermis and every once in a while into the hypodermis. It's going to have two layers to it. We have the epithelial sheath and the connective tissue sheath. The epithelial sheath is going to be an extension of the epidermis. Um, and in burn victims, this epithelial root sheath serves as a source of uh, multipotent stem cells that can repopulate the epidermis. And when a burn victim is recovering from that burn, you'll see little speckles of skin growing on the surface those little speckles of epidermis are epidermal cells that grew up and out of the hair follicle. There's also the connective tissue sheath. That connective tissue sheath is going to wrap around the hair root and the hair fall, the root, and, excuse me, the hair follicle and the epithelial sheath and help to anchor it into the dermis and potentially the hypodermis. We're also going to have a little nerve, typically one nerve fiber per hair follicle. And they are going to wrap around the hair follicle and serve as an early alert. So um, we live in Wisconsin or the Midwest and ticks are a problem in the summertime. And most of us have experienced that creepy sensation while you're, you went for a walk in the woods and all of a sudden you can feel something crawling up your legs. And it's not that you feel it touch the surface of your skin. You're going to feel it wiggling your hairs and those hair receptors oftentimes serve as an early alert system for bugs that are crawling on your skin. Oh, just thinking about it gives me the EBGBs. Ticks and leeches are two phobias of mine in particular. Not, not so much spiders, but ticks in particular. Oh, yuck. We also have an erectile muscle um, or erectile pili muscle, sometimes also referred to as the piloerector muscle. This is a chunk of smooth muscle within the dermis that attaches to the hair follicle. And when it contracts, it, it will bulge up, cause the hair to stand on end, and gives up, give us something known as goosebumps. 
So let's back up here. Um, we can see, not necessarily in this photomicrograph, but in the figure, you can see there's that piloerector muscle the, uh, or the erector muscle um, that gives us our goosebumps and that has its own nerve fiber that controls it. And then we have a separate nerve fiber that innervates the hair follicle that we use for sensory um, input associated with having bugs or other things wiggle the hair shaft above the surface. Now, as we look at our individual hairs, um, they will have some texture to them. So this texture of the hair is going to be related to the cross-sectional shape um, of our hair. Straight hair has a completely round cross-sectional shape. Oval hair, excuse me, wavy hair is oval in its cross-sectional shape. And curly hair tends to be kind of an elongated, flattened cross-sectional shape. So the cross-sectional shape of the hair determines if the hair will go straight, wavy, or curly. Um, think of a transsectional slice to the hair. The color of the hair is due to the kinds of pigments that are going to be excreted into the cortex. Uh, if somebody has brown or black hair, they have lots of eumelanin or that brown-black melanin. If they have red hair, there's two things at play here. They have low levels of eumelanin and high levels of phenylmelanin. If they have blonde hair, they tend to have a small amount of phenylmelanin and very little eumelanin. And if somebody's a strawberry blonde, you know, they're, they're kind of in between blonde and red hair. And then finally, there's gray hair, gray and white hair. And that gray and white hair happens when air becomes present in the medulla. And this is a bit of a tangent, but I want to back up here. Um, let's look at our hair and talk about shampoos. <laughs> and shampoo that's supposed to make your hair uh, reduce split ends on your hairs and so on and so forth. Most shampoo and conditioner is going to only be on the surface of your skin and the hair shaft above the surface of your skin. Most shampoo and conditioner does not go deep down into the hair root and hair follicle and get to the bulb of the hair where we have metabolically active cells. So when we take use a shampoo or conditioner that advertises that it has lots of collagen proteins in it or lots of sulfur containing chemical compounds in it to reduce split ends, I personally am hesitant to believe those claims because the shampoo, those special really expensive shampoos and conditioners are only going to be exposed to dead cells with no metabolic activity and without that don't have the ability to form new cross linkages between their protein molecules, the individual ker keratin proteins. Um, so I tend to be a little skeptical of buying really expensive shampoo or conditioner. Um, my take on split ends and hair quality is a nutritional take. You need to have good nutrition so that you have good building blocks delivered to the bulb of your hair. And then down here at the hair matrix, you could have high quality keratin proteins with high quality cross linkages form while the cells are metabolically active. But that's my personal take on hair care. I'm also the kind of guy who gives myself a buzz cut every couple weeks. So you might not want to get hair fashion advice from me necessarily. I'm not what you would call a fashionista. Um, as we look at the white or gray hair. White or gray hair is typically going to be determined by the amount of air within the medulla. Oh, excuse me one second here. <coughs> Oof, I had to sneeze there. Uh, if somebody has white hair, they tend to have a hollow medulla. And if they have gray hair, they tend to have little air bubbles within their medulla. Um, and for me, I always think of polar bears. And I, it, I think it's cool how polar bears have white hair and their white hairs are hollow on the inside so that polar bear hair is an exceptionally good insulator that helps to keep the bears warm because they live in snow and ice constantly. So what do we use hair for? Um, on human beings, well, not that much. I mean, it's not like we necessarily need hair to stay warm 
Although I will say it does help you stay warm. At one point in my life, for once and only once, I completely shaved my head totally bald and I was freezing. I had to wear a beanie cap in the middle of the summer to deal with how cold I felt all the time. So that hair on your scalp does serve a purpose in terms of regulating body temperature. Um, maybe you've seen those exceptionally hairy dudes that have tons of body hair in their bodies and those kind of outlier of individuals, the, their trunk hair is going to be able to still keep them warm. Um, but most individuals aren't naturally that hairy. So their trunk and torso hair or, or the hair on their limbs and trunk doesn't really keep them warm per se. The big one for us though, is that the, those nerve endings serve to alert us of creepy crawlies that are cr moving across the surface of our skin. Uh, the hair on our scalp, more than just helping us to retain heat, it's going to protect us against sunburn. Um, and also because you think of it, our top of our head is constantly exposed to the sun. Um, so maybe you've experienced this where you parted your hair down the middle and you got sunburned right on the middle, right where you parted your hair. Or maybe you were kind of goofy like me and decided just to shave your head for the heck of it and then got had to deal with sunburn and heat loss. When we look at pubic hair um, and axillary hair, sometimes it's referred to um, as the anogenital hair. Um, that hair is going to signify sexual maturity and will also aid in the transmission of pheromones or sexual sense. Um, and there's also some cultural aspects of this as well. Most people, um, particularly in the United States, don't necessarily appreciate the smell of somebody's armpit, but there are other parts of the world where somebody's natural musk could be considered an attractive or desirable smell. As we think of our nose and our ears, we have a lot of guard hairs, technically referred to as vibrissae. And these vibrissae are going to make it so that it's difficult for large bugs to crawl into our nose or into our ears. And then we also have eyelashes and eyebrows. They're used frequently for nonverbal communication, but they're also used to help regulate water and dust. So if you think of your eyebrows in particular, eyebrows will take sweat from your forehead and redirect that sweat away from your eyes. Eyelashes um, help keep particles, physical particles out of your eyes. And for um, myself, my brothers and my children, we have a genetic disposition for freakishly large eyelashes or larger than normal eyelashes, which means that we can squint our eyes just a little bit and keep most of the dust and debris out of our eyes, um, which is nice. But on the flip side, when we go swimming, um, lots of water gets redirected by the eyelashes directly into our eyes and that chlorinated water stings like a son of a gun. Let's talk about nails, fingernails and toenails. So as you look at our nails, they're very clear, they're very hard, and they're a modified form of the stratum corneum. They have a lot of highly cross-linked keratin within them. We use our nails for grooming. They help us to pick stuff off of our body, to rip food apart, and just to, generally speaking, grab things. Um, and it also just serves as a protective counter um, or a counter force on our fingertips and tips of our toes so that we can get better sensation and you know i'm that kind of guy who's always smashing my fingers fingertips and stuff car doors regular doors whenever i swing a hammer I, it's really nice to have this hard nail bed just to serve to him for lack of a better term armor plate my fingertips and the tips of my toes I, I stub my toes all the time and it hurts like a son of a gun. Now, whether you're looking at a toenail or a fingernail, there's that nail body, the nail plate itself. And as you look at the, the nail, the nail plate, the hard part, that's what most people think of. There's the part that's dangling, the free edge. I mean, I'm gonna advance the slide here so we can talk about the picture. So we have the free edge, that's the part that hangs over the edge. We have the nail body, which is embedded um, into the skin, the underlying skin. And then we have the nail root, which is typically not exposed. And that nail root is going to have the matrix where we grow new nail bed, where we regrow our fingernail. Um, something that's kind of interesting is that between toenails and fingernails, 
fingernails will have twice the rate of growth as a toenail. And when we look at a fingernail, we're looking at about a millimeter to two millimeters per week. And the protein content of your diet is a significant factor in the rate of nail growth. And then toenails are typically going to grow at a half a millimeter to one millimeter per week, which is why most people will clip their fingernails once a week. But toenails, you know, it's easy to ignore them because they grow so slowly. I'm going to back up here just a second. So as we think of that root, the nail root is formally defined as the part of the, the nail plate that goes under your skin. And then the nail body is the part that you can see, but that's not attached to you. Um, we also have, and this is kind of a fun word to say, eponychium. It's fun to say, hard to spell. It's the, it's the technical name for the nail cuticle. And then that white region right here, um, I'm not going to ask you about this in a lecture exam, but maybe you can impress somebody at a cocktail party and say, oh, you have very nice lunules of your fingernails. And it's just um, that whitish part of the nail bed or the nail body that's right next to the nail root. So where we have keratin that's still in the process of solidifying, becoming more hard or hardening. That's all we have for this discussion on hair and nails. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to shoot them to me via email or post them on the class discussion board. And as always, happy studies.